You see the president walking into the Roosevelt Room now. Let us go now live to President Biden and his reaction to the Supreme Court ruling. 45 years, 445 years, the United States Supreme Court has recognized the college's freedom to decide how, how to build diverse student bodies and to meet their responsibility of opening doors of opportunity for every single American. <clears throat> in case after case, including recently, uh, just as a few years ago in 2016, the court has affirmed and reaffirmed this view, that colleges could use race not as a determinative factor for admission, but as one of the factors among many in deciding who to admit from a, quali from a qualified, already qualified pool of applicants. Today, the court once again walked away from decades of precedent and make, as the dissent has made clear. The dissent states in today's decision, quote, rolls back decades of precedent and momentous progress, end of quote. I agree with that statement from the dissent. From, from the dissent. <clears throat> the court has effectively ended affirmative action in college admissions. And I strongly, strongly disagree with the court's decision. Because affirmative action is so misunderstood, I want to be clear, make sure everybody's clear about what the law has been and what it has not been until today. Many people wrongly believe that affirmative action allows unqualified students, unqualified students to be admitted ahead of qualified students. This is not, this is not how college admissions work. Rather, colleges set out standards for admission, and every student, every student has to meet those standards. Then and only then, after first meeting the qualifications required by the school, do colleges look at other factors in addition to their grades, such as race. The way it works in practice is this. Colleges first establish a qualified pool of candidates based on meeting certain grade, test scores, and other criteria. Then and only then, then and only then, it is from this pool of applicants, all of whom have already met the school standards, that the class is chosen after weighing a wide range of factors, among them being race. You know, I've always believed that one of the greatest strengths of America, you're tired of hearing me say it, is our diversity. But I believe that. If you have any doubt about this, just look at the United States military the finest fighting force in the history of the world. It's been a model of diversity, and has not only been our, made our nation better, stronger, but safer. I believe the same is true for our schools. I've always believed that the promise of America is big enough for everyone to succeed, and that every generation of Americans, we have benefited by opening the doors of opportunity just a little bit wider to include those who've been left behind. I believe our colleges are stronger, when they are racially diverse. Our nation is stronger because we use, because we are tapping into the full range of talent in this nation. I also believe that while talent, creativity, and hard work are everywhere across this country, not equal opportunity. It is not everywhere across this country. We cannot let this decision be the last word. I want to emphasize we cannot let this decision be the last word. While the court can render a decision, it cannot change what America stands for. America is an idea, an idea unique in the world, an idea of hope, an opportunity, of possibilities, of giving everyone a fair shot, of leaving no one behind. We've never fully lived up to it, but we've never walked away from it either. We will not walk away from it now. We should never allow the country to walk away from the dream upon which it was founded. That opportunity is for everyone, not just a few. We need a new path forward a path consistent with the law that protects diversity and expands opportunity. So today, I want to offer some guidance to our nation's colleges as they review their admission systems after today's decision. Guidance that is consistent with today's decision. They should not abandon — let me say this again — they should not abandon their commitment to ensure student bodies of diverse backgrounds and experience that reflect all of America. What I propose for consideration is a new standard where colleges take into account the adversity a student has overcome when selecting among qualified applicants. Let's be clear. Under this new standard, just as was true under the earlier standard, students first have to be qualified applicants. They need the GPA and test scores to meet the school's standards. Once that test is met, then adversity should be considered, including, including lack, a student's lack of financial means, 
because we know too few students of low-income families, whether in big cities or rural communities, are getting an opportunity to go to college. When the poor kid, when a poor kid, maybe the first in their family to go to college, gets the same grades and test scores as a wealthy kid, whose whole family's gone to the most elite colleges in the country, and whose path has been a lot easier. Well, the kid who faced tougher challenges has demonstrated more grit, more determination, and that should be a factor that colleges should take into account in admissions, and many still do. It also means examining where the student grew up and went to high school. It means understanding the particular hardships that each individual student has faced in life, including racial discrimination that individuals have faced in their own lives. The court says, quote, Nothing in this opinion should be construed as prohibiting universities from considering an application's discussion of how race has affected his or her life, but it's, it's through, but be it through discrimination or inspiration or otherwise, end of quote. Because the truth is, we all know it, discrimination still exists in America. Discrimination still exists in America. Discrimination still exists in America. Today's decision does not change that. It's a simple fact. If a student has, has overcome, had to overcome adversity on their path to education, a college should recognize and value that. Our nation's colleges and universities should be engines of expanding opportunity through upward mobility. But today, too often, that's not the case. The statistics, one, one statistic, students from the top 1% of family incomes in America are 77 times more likely to get into elite college than one from the bottom 20% of family incomes. 77% greater opportunity. Today, for too many schools, the only people who benefit from the system are the wealthy and the well-connected. The odds have been stacked against working people for much too long. We need a higher education system that works for everyone, from, App from Appalachia to Atlanta and to far beyond. We can and must do better, and we will. Today, <clears throat> I'm directing the Department of Education to analyze what practices help build a more inclusive and diverse student bodies and what practices hold that back. Practices like legacy admissions and other systems <clears throat> expand privilege instead of opportunity. Colleges and universities should continue their commitment to support, retain, and graduate the first students and classes. You know, and companies, companies who are already realizing the value of diversity should not use this decision as an excuse to turn away from diversity either. <clears throat> we can't go backwards. You know, I know today's court decision is a severe disappointment to so many people, including me. But we cannot let the decision be a permanent setback for the country. We need to keep an open door of opportunities. We need to remember that diversity is our strength. <clears throat> we have to find a way forward. We need to remember that the promise of America is big enough for everyone to succeed. You know, that's the work of my administration, and I'm always going to fight for that. And I want to thank you all. And I know you've been told I have a helicopter out there waiting to go up to do an interview in New York. I'll be talking more about this live interview. But thank you very much, and we're going to have plenty of time to talk about this. But we're not going to let this break us. Thank you. President Biden, the Congressional Black Caucus said the Supreme Court has thrown into question its own legitimacy. Is this a rogue court? This is not a normal court. Should there be term limits for the justices, sir? As President Biden left the Roosevelt Room, he took one question. Is this a rogue court? The president said it is not a normal co court. Let us go to senior White House and political correspondent Ed O'Keefe, who joins us from the North Lawn of the White House. Ed, the president said the Supreme Court has, and these are the president's words, effectively ended affirmative action in college admissions. He said the court cannot have the last word, and there has to be a new path forward. Then he said there should be guidance. He provided that guidance. Please summarize and tell us what that tells us about how prepared this White House was for this decision. Yeah, they're in a series of cases they've been waiting for this session, one of them that's been reviewed and, and for which scenarios were prepared is this one. And you heard him say there, there should be a new standard regarding adversity a student has overcome and then some other general guidelines. That is actually consistent with what the court was writing today, saying that it can be considered alongside things like adversity and whatnot. The president is speaking to a country 
in which a majority believe affirmative action programs should be continued, should be allowed to continue. But on the specific issue of race-based college admissions, just 30 percent of Americans believe they should be allowed. And so you heard the president there try to clarify what exactly Harvard and the University of North Carolina were up to and how going forward potentially race could continue to be a factor. But that signal that he's asking the education department to look into this in plainer English is I'm looking for some kind of executive action or clarification I can give to the nation's uh, institutes of higher learning going forward in the wake of this decision. Hey, before I go to Nicole Killian, who's here at the desk with me, after the Dobbs decision last year, there were some in the Democratic Party who thought the White House was slow-footed in its response, did have a comprehensive way to talk about this and respond. Do you detect in this reaction from the president today and some of the specifics you just outlined better preparation? I do, uh, because we've, they've been channeling for the last several weeks that on this case and on the forthcoming decision regarding the student loan forgiveness program, a handful of others that they have been anticipating potential scenarios and have been preparing potential options for the president. They don't want to talk about them publicly. Uh, but there's also been a broader preparation in the political space. And if we can, Major, we should call out some pretty rare and unique comments today from the former First Lady, Michelle Obama. You may have seen this uh, earlier, but she gave a pretty long statement uh, recalling her own personal experience as a student at Princeton and Harvard Law. And in part, she bemoans the fact that, quote, so often we just accept that money, power, and privilege are perfectly justifiable forms of affirmative action, while kids growing up, like I did, are expected to compete when the ground is anything but level. So today my heart breaks for any young person out there who's wondering what their future holds and what kinds of chances will be open to them. And while I know the strength and grit that lies inside kids who've always had to sweat a little more to climb the same ladders, I hope and I pray that the rest of us are willing to sweat a little too. She's also knocking the fact that legacy, whether your parents give to that university, have been a leg up for many people, uh, but there's never been a legal challenge to that. And we should point out, both the president just now and Justice Neil Gorsuch, in a concurring opinion, suggested that that acceptance of, of legacy or whether your parents are giving big money to university should be reconsidered and perhaps done away with. It is a factor at Harvard University as well, uh, which, of course, was the subject of today's legal challenge. And many institutions around our country. I want to bring yeah. in congressional correspondent Nicole Killian. Lots of reaction on Capitol Hill, though Congress is not in session in preparation for the long Independence Weekend that approaches. Some of the reaction that's most notable to you, Nicole. Well, certainly a lot of the reaction has fallen on party lines. Of course, you have a lot of Democrats who are criticizing this decision. Many Republicans, though, supporting it, saying that this is a welcome step. For instance, take Speaker Kevin McCarthy, who says now students will be able to compete based on equal standards and individual merit. And this will make the college admissions process fair and uphold equality under the law, we heard similar sentiment from Minority Leader Mitch McConnell, who said that the Supreme Court decision is a long overdue step. Uh, that being said, though, you know, again, when you look at what Democrats have said, uh, for instance, Leader uh, Hakeem Jeffries, the first black minority leader in the House, uh, he said that the court has turned a blind eye to systemic racism, which I think is a point that you heard President Biden make and one that stuck to me. You know, the discrimination still exists in America. And I think that is the debate and the argument that we saw from the justices today as well, where you have Chief Justice John Roberts arguing eliminating racial discrimination means eliminating all of it, but yet you have someone like Katanji Brown Jackson in the dissent saying deeming race irrelevant in law does not make it so in life. When you have health disparities, when you still have a racial wealth gap, when you still have housing discrimination. So, uh, you know, are we really equal? I think, you know, when we look in terms of where we are as a society, you know, there's so much of an argument about are we in a post-racial society. And here you have some Democrats saying, no, that discrimination still exists. That's why these policies should still stand, which is why the president is proposing additional action. Thank you so much for that, Nicole. Joining us now is our CBS News legal contributor, Jessica Levinson. Jessica, in the basic, most fundamental sense, what is the legal orientation of the majority in reaching this conclusion, this historic conclusion? The majority is saying that affirmative action programs are largely racial discrimination and that the 14th Amendment Equal Protection Clause does not allow colleges and universities to do what they've been doing 
since 1978, which is consider race as a separate standalone factor. And as we heard, now it's going to be up to colleges and universities to try and figure out how to get a racially diverse student body while considering other factors and or how race affects an applicant's experience, but not as a separate factor. Jessica Levinson, thank you so very much. Our coverage will continue on CBS News Streaming, your local news, and tonight on the CBS Evening News. This has been a CBS News Special Report. I'm Major Garrett in Washington.